The Canadian Pacific Railroad had legions of SD-40s, 555 to be exact, 65 SD-40s and 490 2 models which together arguably made up one of the largest concentrations of a single diesel locomotive model on any railroad roster. The SD40-2 is widely heralded as the greatest diesel locomotive that was ever built, and January 2022 represents 50 years since the model was introduced to the railroads. I'm Railfan AC, and you're watching Trains in the 21st Century. Years before the Norfolk Southern unveiled its 20 heritage diesels to the world in 2012 and before the Union Pacific had its six heritage locomotives before that, the Canadian Pacific had its own heritage fleet in northeastern Pennsylvania. Fitting since the Delaware and Hudson was the product of the very first rail ventures in America. Its original Penn Division main line which ran through Carbondale, Pennsylvania to Nineveh, New York and east to Albany was abandoned in favor of the ex-Lackawanna line which runs from Taylor Yard north to Binghamton and east to Oneonta and Albany and north to Montreal, Quebec in Canada. At least two EMD Jeeps were repainted in the DNH's famous blue and gray lightning stripe livery that was not only one of the sharpest paint schemes in the region but was also a favorite among many rail fans. Units number 7303, which had gold lettering, and number 7312, which had blue lettering, like the DNH itself, operated in relative obscurity when compared to the waves made by the announcement of UP's and NS's heritage fleets. And now, as CP has long since departed northeastern Pennsylvania for good and took what was left of the original DNH with it, we get a glimpse of a railroad that not only survived in an era when most of its neighbors were collapsing into Conrail but also a legacy of a bridge line that now serves two masters. When compared to the dazzling colors of Norfolk Southern's heritage fleet, its black and white diesels don't stir up a whole lot of excitement in most rail fans, but there are some diesels that stand out from the rest and are deserving of a spotlight all of their own. On the NSDNH Sunbury line, there's a small group of locomotives that have been given a heritage status that's unique to this historical railroad. I call them the DNH class. 
Blessed with one of the sharpest paint schemes in the Northeast region and an acknowledged rail fan for a chief executive, the Delaware and Hudson was the bright spot in Northeastern railroading during the dark days of the collapse of its neighbors into Conrail. But alas, despite its most valiant efforts to survive as an independent carrier, the blue and gray couldn't compete with the big blue. This prompted a rocky romance with the Guilford Rail System in 1984 as well as a short fling with the Susquehanna around 1989 before falling under the control of the Canadian Pacific in 1990. And though not a railroad known for its heritage units, it could be argued that Canadian Pacific started the heritage game when it restored a few D&H locomotives to their original paint for use on the line. The Electromotive Division of General Motors began to develop its 50 series of 4-axle and 6-axle locomotives in the mid to late 1970s. It was a transitional model in more than one respect. The 50s were the last to use the 645 engine and the first to use the new Super Series wheel slip control system. The use of the Super Series on the 50s was implemented just before the microprocessor era was ushered in on the 60 series locomotives that followed. Facing increased competition from General Electric, EMD decided to push the 645 prime mover further than it had ever gone before, to 3,500 and eventually 3,600 horsepower. The extra power would be sent to the new D87 traction motors that boosted the continuous ratings by more than 10% compared with the older D77 traction motors. To develop the new model, EMD produced both 4- and 6-axle prototypes called the GP40X, of which 23 were built in late 1977 and early 1978, and the SD40X, of which 4 were made. Both locomotives were strikingly different from their 40 series predecessors. The GP40X featured flared radiators and almost half of them rode on the new HTB truck design, while the SD40X had a lengthened long hood to accommodate the relocation of the dynamic brakes from above the engine to behind the cab. Both were built on the existing frame length of the GP40-2 and SD40-2, though production SD50s, following the delivery of six Norfolk and Western SD50S units on an SD40-2 length frame, would be built on a frame that was about two feet longer than the SD40-2. The prototypes were built and painted for the railroad they would test on, with four GP40Xs going to the Southern Pacific, six to the Union Pacific, 10 to the Santa Fe, and 3 to the Southern Railway. Four SD40X locomotives painted in Kansas City Southern Colors were delivered in 1979. Unfortunately, reliability problems plagued the 50 series diesel, so the locomotives never truly replaced the widely successful 40 series locomotives that came before them. Because of this, EMD never took the 40 series diesels off of the books, and both the 40 and 50 series were sold side by side during the life of the GP50 SD50 production. Ironically, the last GP40-2 and SD40-2 orders came after production ended on the 50 series in the mid-1980s. The 50 series had several unique models and applications. The first was the previously mentioned high-adhesion HTB trucks under the SP and UP GP40Xs designed to address several issues with older truck designs but was never ordered by a railroad. The Southern Pacific GP40Xs were also delivered with experimental elephant ears over the radiators, drawing cooler air near the frame while the units ran through tunnels. A single order for four-width car body SD50s for the Canadian National was built called the SD50F. Burlington Northern ordered five GP50s with larger cabs to accommodate extra crew members in the mid-1980s when cabooses were being eliminated. Designed but never built was a GP50 derivative for the Rio Grande using the successful SD45 T-2 tunnel motor radiator design called the GP50T. Today, only a handful of short lines still use the GP50s and SD50s, and three of the seven Class 1 railroads still roster 50 series units, the BNSF, the CSX, and the Kansas City Southern. KCS had both the SD40X and SD50 models, but all original units have been retired. Many of BNSF's units have upgraded electronics and or have been re-rated to either 2500 or 2950 horsepower and reclassified as a different configuration. 
The re-rated units use the GP25 and GP25X model designations and upgraded GP50s are now called GP50-3s. BNSF increased its GP50 fleet in 2017 with the purchase of two second-hand GP50s. The units were cycled through the company's Topeka shops and released for service that summer. Nine locomotives were built as test beds for EMD's new 3,000 horsepower 645 series engine and AR-10 alternator using SD35 frames. They were classified by EMD as the SD40X. The first EMDX number 434 was built at the start of the SD35 production in 1964. The radiator intakes were slightly longer than on the SD35, but not as long as on the SD40, and there were three closely spaced 48-inch radiator fans on the roof. This unit later became Gulfmobile and Ohio number 950, and eventually Illinois Central number 6071, and has been preserved following retirement from active service in 2009. Six more were built in early 1965 and numbered EMDX's number 434A through 434F alongside a single GP40X numbered EMDX number 433A built on a GP35 frame. As the radiator section of the first test bed was too long for the GP35 hood, 433A and 434A through 434F all used canted radiator intakes that were the same length as on the GP35 slash SD35, resulting in three closely spaced 48-inch fans located very near the end of the long hood. This radiator design was later used on the GP40P that was built for the Central Railroad of New Jersey. These units also used the wider exhaust stack housing that would later be used on the 40 series units. The last two SD40Xs, EMDXs number 434G and 434H, were built at the same time as the 434E and 434F and introduced the radiator design that was ultimately adopted for the SD40 with flat radiator intakes significantly longer than any of the earlier units, allowing for the fans to be slightly further apart. The eight later demonstrators were sold to the Union Pacific and numbered 3040 through 3047 in the middle of Union Pacific's other SD40 units. One of them, number 3046, was still in service in 2020 on the Wheeling and Lake Erie. One thing that I need to point out, these early SD40 demonstrators are not to be confused with the GP40X and the SD40Xs built in the late 1970s which were the test beds for the EMD50 series that we just talked about. And this is a westbound train on the Conrail. Well, no, yeah, yeah, it's still Conrail at this time on the Conrail Southern Tier. But what we're interested in today is that middle unit. That is a rare PLM unit. Now, PLM stood for Preferred Lease Management. And there were only 10 of those units. At least there were only 10 of them at the time. I don't know if they've since gotten more. I don't even know if they're even still in existence. But at the time, they only had 10 of them. And this particular engine ran up and down the Delaware and Hudson a lot, ran right through here, right on our own Sunbury line. It ran through there a lot. And you can see it here now heading westbound to Buffalo, New York on a Conrail trackage rights train, or a CP rail slash Conrail trackage rights train. I say CP, it's a CP rail train on utilizing Conrail trackage rights. Getting back to these PLM engines, there were only 10 of these engines. And they were all ex-Missouri Pacific or Union Pacific. So, and I guess you could say in essence they were all ex-Union Pacific, but some of them were originally Missouri Pacific. They weren't numbered consecutively like you would expect, like say, like the class unit of these engines was 3,000. Now, but it didn't go 3,000, 3,001, 3,002, 3,003, you get the picture. It went just like this. 3,000, 3,004, 3,018, 
3021, 3029, 3041, 3052, 3058, and 3104. Now, 3000 and 3004 were ex Missouri Pacifics. 3018, 3021, and 3029, they were Union Pacifics. 3041 was a Union Pacific too, but there was something special about that engine, and we'll get back to that. 3052 was a Union Pacific, 3058 was a Missouri Pacific, and 3104 was a Union Pacific. Getting back to the 3041, that's not your average SD40. That was actually a Union Pacific SD40X. Not a whole lot's told about these engines except the fact that they did run on the CP DNH back in the 90s. I'm not sure when the last one stopped running through here, but when CP took over the line, you saw a lot of lease power. You mostly saw the red and yellow Gaddix engines and the blue and yellow Gaddix engines. Gaddix meaning the General American Transportation Company, I think that's what it stands for. Pretty sure that's what it stands for. Preferred lease management still exists to this day, but I don't know if they're still leasing locomotives. I do know that they lease truck trailers. In fact, I pulled I pulled several of them back. Well, it's it's been a while now, but I pulled several of their trailers. The GP40 was introduced in 1966 as an evolution of the GP35. Along with the GP38 and similar SD series units, it marked the introduction of EMD 645 series engine, which used the same engine block dimensions as the 567 series, but incorporated modified power assemblies with a larger cylinder bore. In the GP40, a 16-cylinder turbocharged version of the engine produced 3,000 horsepower. The GP40 also used an alternator rectifier electrical system addressing one of the biggest reliability concerns of the GP35 in which the DC generator required 16 stages of transition to handle a 2500 horsepower output. The GP38 was a 16 cylinder non-turbocharged roots blown model that produced 2000 horsepower initially using a DC generator and later in the GP38 AC using the same AR10 alternator as the GP40. The GP39, introduced a couple of years later, used a turbocharged 12-cylinder engine producing 2,300 horsepower. Both the GP38 and GP40 were fairly strong sellers, together accounting for more than 2,000 locomotives built, although only 23 GP39s were ever built, most for the Chesapeake and Ohio. In 1972, EMD introduced an updated Dash 2 series that replaced the GP38, the GP39, and the GP40 with the GP38-2 the GP39-2 and the GP40-2, respectively. Many GP38s and GP38 ACs remained in service with their original owners or their successors well into the 21st century. GP40s in their original form started to disappear from the Class 1 railroads in the 1990s, but many were rebuilt or continued in service on smaller railroads. A fairly large number of GP38s and GP40s have received upgraded Dash 2 modular or Dash 3 microprocessor electrical systems and a number of GP40s have been converted to GP38 variations by the replacement of the turbocharger with a roots blower. <laughs> 
increase from 2,500 to 3,000 horsepower necessitated a larger radiator section with three 48-inch fans in place of the one 36-inch and two 48-inch fans that was found on the GP35. The GP40 adopted the general hood dimensions and radiator design of the last two SD40X demonstrators, which were based on the SD35. This increased the overall length from 56 feet 2 inches to 59 feet 2 inches. The rear truck was moved one foot inward from the rear pilot face, making it symmetrical with the front truck and resulting in 34 foot truck centers compared to the 32 foot on the GP35. The longer frame allowed for a longer fuel tank, which increased in capacity to 3,600 gallons, although smaller sizes were also used. The walkway side frame was 5 inches tall above the air reservoirs compared to 3 inches on the late GP35 or 7 inches on the early GP35. And air piping was relocated inboard of the air reservoirs rather than on the outside. On the hood, the dynamic brake fan and intakes were moved rearward and the taper of the dynamic brake hatch was made steeper at the rear than the front. Aside from this and the longer radiator section, the cab and hood were otherwise the same between the late GP35 and the early GP40. As on the GP28, which was the non-turbocharged version of the GP35, the GP38 used the same hood design as the GP40, but incorporated shorter radiator intakes with only two 48-inch fans and two exhaust stacks in place of the single turbocharger stack. By the early 1970s, many first-generation diesels were reaching the end of their service lives. The most common replacement locomotives became the GP40-2. EMD began production of the 16-cylinder turbocharged 3,000 horsepower engine in 1972. These locomotives were developed for service where higher horsepower and faster service were preferable. A major feature for the GP40-2 was the introduction of the Dash 2 modular electrical cabinet. For more than 40 years, the GP40-2 worked mainline freights, locals, switching jobs, yard service, and helper service, and many remain in service to this day. The GP40-2 was introduced by EMD in 1972 as a replacement for the GP40. It retained the same 3,000 horsepower 645 series engine but received a host of mechanical and electrical upgrades geared at improving reliability and ease of maintenance. Production continued until the end of 1986. The GP50, which we talked about earlier, was introduced in 1980 and was built concurrently with the late GP40-2 production and both were succeeded by the GP60. Like the GP40, the GP40-2 can be identified by having four axles, three 48-inch radiator cooling fans, and a clean-lined hood with a single turbocharger exhaust stack that was changed to a flat silencer housing on later units.
While the overall dimensions and proportions were retained with the start of the Dash 2 series, many small detail changes were made to the entire locomotive. As a result, almost every part of the cab and hood was changed in some way. Far too much to get into in this video. Like its four-axle cousin, the SD40 was introduced in 1966 as an evolution of the SD35. It marked the introduction of EMD's 645 series engine, which used the same engine block dimensions as the 567 series but incorporated modified power assemblies with a larger cylinder bore. The SD40 also used an alternator rectifier electrical system addressing one of the biggest reliability concerns of the SD35, in which the DC generator required nine stages of transition to handle a 2500 horsepower output. Along with the SD40, which used a 3000 horsepower 16 cylinder turbocharged engine, three other variations were introduced. The SD38, which used a 2000 horsepower roots blown engine replacing the SD28. The SD45, which used a 3600 horsepower 20 cylinder engine. And a couple of years later, the SD39, which used a 2300 horsepower 12 cylinder engine. The SD38 initially used a DC generator, but later in the SD38 AC, used the same AR-10 alternator as the SD-40. While only a few dozen of each of the SD-38 and SD-39 were sold, the SD-40 and SD-45 both sold more than 1,200 locomotives, marking the first time that EMD's SD series outsold their four-axle general purpose counterparts. The SD-45 also marked the end of EMD's horsepower race of the 1960s with the comparative reliability and versatility of the 3,000 horsepower SD-40 paving the way for the hugely successful SD-40-2. And despite popular myth, and I hope that I can finally put this myth to rest once and for all, the SD-45 was no less fuel efficient than the SD-40 on a per horsepower basis. The 20% increase in horsepower and fuel consumption came with neither an increase in fuel capacity nor in tractive effort at low speeds, where weight and adhesion could be the limiting factor. In 1972, EMD introduced an updated Dash 2 series replacing the SD-38, the SD-40, and the SD-45 with the SD-38-2, the SD-40-2, and the SD-45-2, respectively. An SD-39-2 was apparently cataloged but was never built. While some SD-40s and SD-45s were retired by the 1990s, many more continued in service into the 21st century, often in modified or rebuilt form. Many SD-40s received upgraded Dash 2 modular or Dash 3 microprocessor electrical systems. A number of SD-45s were derated from their original 3600 horsepower rating, either through derating the original 20-cylinder engine or replacing it with the 16-cylinder version. This is a TFM locomotive, the old Kansas City, well, I shouldn't say the old Kansas City Southern New Mexico, the new Kansas City Southern New Mexico, but the railroad is the Transportacion Faro Via Viaria Mexicana is the name of a company dedicated to freight transportation using rail in the northeastern part of Mexico. KCSM is fully owned and operated by Kansas City Southern who owns who owns its fleet and the rights to operate and maintain a rail system through a concession from the Mexican government. The majority of the rail system spans from the Mexico City Valley to the United States border at Laredo, Texas. There are also tracks that connect to the port cities of Lazario, Cardenas, and Veracruz, giving Kansas City Southern to Mexico a unique position because they connect both the Gulf of Mexico and the Pacific Ocean to the United States border. Kansas City Southern to Mexico was originally formed in 1996 when Kansas City Southern Industries and Transportacion Marit. Tima Mexicana, TMM, purchased a government concession to operate on a rail system in Mexico. It was the Mexican president, Ernesto Zedillo, who proposed the privatization 
of the Mexican railways because the Mexican railway system had fallen into a state of disrepair and needed drastic work to, to become profitable. Since the late 1930s, Mexican trains and tracks were properly were property of the government as Faro... Mm, okay, this is the, the Nationalist de Mexico. The nationalized railroad operated successfully for many years, yet by the 1990s, the system was so poorly run that U.S. railways would not even send rail cars into Mexico for fear that they would not be returned. When the decision to privatize the railroad was made, only 15% of freight was moved by rail in Mexico versus 42% in the U.S. The most sought-after portion of the concessions, called the Northeast Railroad, was bid on by major companies, including the United States' largest railroad company, the Union Pacific. This concession included about 3,600 mi kilometers, 2,261 miles of track, which, with connections to many key cities, including Monterey, Mexico City, and Laredo. This track carried 40% of all rail traffic in Mexico and 60% of all rail traffic coming from the United States. KCSM and TMM bid and won the concession for $1.4 billion in United States dollars for the right to operate the concession, paying 49% and 51% respectively. In 2005, Kansas City Southern Industries purchased Transportación Maritima Mexicana share in TFM, giving them full ownership of the company, and the TFM was officially renamed Kansas City Southern to Mexico, 